okay, this is where the plot lines all sort of start colliding with each other, so hang on to your hair. Sir Toby convinces Sir Andrew to challenge Cesario to a duel over Olivia, which neither of them actually wants to fight. Antonio shows up and defends who he thinks is Sebastian and promptly gets arrested and dragged away. This clues Viola into the fact that her brother might still be alive, so off she goes. Sir Andrew goes after her with the intent of finishing the duel, but unfortunately for him, he runs into Sebastian, who does know how to fight and proceeds to kick his butt. Then. We get another scene, a final scene, of Toby and company messing with Malvolio, by way of having the fool, Fasti, talk to him disguised as a priest. It's actually sort of a disturbing scene in some ways, because by this point, Malvolio is actually coming a little unhinged. Anyway, Toby says they'd better not go any further with this prank, because Olivia's starting to get pretty annoyed with them, so he goes off with Mariah and tells Fasti to sort it out. Okay, meanwhile, Olivia, uh, Orsino, bleh, Orsino shows up at Olivia's house with Viola in tow. They run into Antonio being escorted off by the guards, and Antonio chews out Sebastian for having ditched him after three months. Orsino is understandably confused by this sentiment because, hello, Cesario's been with him for the past three months. Apparently it's been three months since the beginning of this play. Anyway, Olivia comes out wanting to know where Cesario has got to, and she lets it slip that at some point since the last time we saw them, they've gotten married. Orsino flips out. Viola denies that she ever married anybody, and this is when Sir Andrew comes in, shouting about how Cesario has beaten them up. Viola denies that she did that too, and everyone just starts shouting at each other, and things are getting crazy when finally, thank God, in comes Sebastian. Everyone does a double take, and Olivia basically goes, sweet, two Cesarios! Then the whole story comes out about the shipwreck, and them being twins, and Viola actually being a girl, at which point Orsino goes, sweet, and promptly proposes to her. So it looks like everyone's gonna live happily ever after. Except that it's at this point that Festi comes in with a note from Malvolio protesting how horribly he's been treated and explaining that he's not actually crazy. So they have to go send somebody to let him out. He comes back and shows the original love note to Olivia, who pronounces it a fake, because it is. Festi then explains the whole prank on the note, including the fact that apparently at some point Toby has married Mariah offstage. Malvolio listens quite calmly to all of this exposition and then declares that he's going to get revenge on all of them and stalks off. So we end the play with three couples, three guys kind of left awkwardly hanging in some situation or another, and Festy left on stage singing a surprisingly sad song. So, you know, for as, as wacky and crazy as this play is, which it is, it ends on a pretty weird note, and depending on how it's played, it can really be kind of a downer ending. You know, Shakespeare does that a lot, though. He gets tragedy in his comedy and comedy in his tragedy all the time. He's a genre bender. Twelfth Night is a particularly notable example, though, and that last act is full of things that, that don't really make sense when you think about them. So let's pick some of them apart. The first and most obvious one is the Malvolio problem. Shakespeare just flings that in there right in the middle of the happy, joyous reunion proposal scene, and it pretty effectively kills the mood. Shakespeare likes to do that too. Actually, he does it in Love's Labor's Lost, for one, except there it's four couples and they don't even get to get married at the end. But anyway, Malvolio has really been treated terribly this entire play. And to be fair, at the beginning it's hilarious, but by the end it starts to seem like disproportionate retribution for a guy who was really just trying to do his job. And again, depending on how Malvolio is played, he can be a complete d-bag who the audience really wants to see get taken down a peg or two, or he can be pretty sympathetic. I've seen both. Then we have the Antonio problem. Antonio legitimately seems to be pretty devoted to Sebastian, but in the end, Sebastian does kinda ditch him for a chick he just met. Actually, Antonio in The Merchant of Venice winds up in a similar situation, Ray Bassanio, but that's an explanation for another episode. Antonio, also, we don't know what happens to him at the end of the play. I mean, do they let him go? Do they 
pitch him in Malvolio's old cell? Do they hang pirates in Illyria? We don't know. We don't find out. Okay, and then I think the really big problem here is what is going to happen to these couples after the end of this play? Setting aside Toby and Mariah's offstage marriage for a second, let's look at the other two. Viola and Orsino, to be fair, might be okay. They have had the whole play to get to know each other, although Viola's been a dude the entire time. Actually, in some ways, her disguise gives her an advantage. Being a guy lets her interact and express opinions in a way that she couldn't if she were a woman. I mean, look at Olivia and Orsino's interactions. They don't talk to each other face to face for the entire play until the end, and he's supposed to be in love with her. So the point is, Viola's disguise lets her get to know Orsino on something remotely approaching her own terms. On the other hand, that does bring up a Federation standard crapload of homoerotic subtext that a lot of productions don't really want to touch, so that can get kind of awkward in performance. Okay, and then on the other side we have Sebastian and Olivia who, there's no getting around it, they just met. They have all of a scene and a half together before they're running off to find a priest, and when they get married, Olivia thinks Sebastian is someone else. I mean, the play doesn't really deal with this because it's right at the end and everyone's just so relieved that Olivia didn't accidentally marry a chick, but still, you kind of have to wonder how that marriage is gonna go. And then last, you have Festy's song there at the end, which is basically all about how being funny gets you nowhere in life and the world just goes on and doesn't care and we just keep trying anyway. I mean, that's how I read it anyway. I'll play it for you sometime and you guys can judge for yourselves. But the point is, Twelfth Night reads like four acts of comedy and one of commentary. It's like Shakespeare is showing us with this play that we can't escape into the world of comedy forever because sooner or later the play's gonna end and real life doesn't work like theater. If you read that much into it, anyway, we can subject Shakespeare to this kind of analysis all we want, but at the end of the day, Shakespeare wrote these plays to make money. That's the bottom line. He wrote plays that the audience would enjoy and keep coming back to see, and it worked! <laughs> Twelfth Night is an awesome play, and the weird stuff at the end just makes it stick in your brain more. You've been watching One Take Shakespeare. See you next time. Now I just wish I could get this stupid ring off my finger. Hey! Cool! <laughs>